Hello everyone and welcome to Solar System Tourism and Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1 with Realism Overhaul. This series is recorded during Twitch live streams and viewers use the in-stream currency, struts, they earn by watching to travel to destinations around the solar system. In this video though, I'm mainly setting up a moon base for people to visit, not actually sending them out. I apparently missed recording the launch of this first base module on a New Glenn rocket, but here it is transferring to the moon, and it will land with the assistance of that orange, that's what I call that sort of sky crane system. Unfortunately, I think I was expecting that the New Glenn upper stage would capture this into orbit around the moon, and that turned out not to be the case, it didn't have enough, so this orange had to do it, and that was not according to plan. As a result, I aimed for a direct landing, uh, which I, I wouldn't say would be the most efficient, but it's certainly the most dramatic. And so here the orange is trying to land this base module on the moon directly. But the margins are super tight, and I ultimately decide that we would need to dump the supplies in the base module, the food, water, and oxygen, in order to try and make the landing. So there it all goes. Dumping the food is a little bit dubious because we have nobody in there to like throw it out the hatch or anything. But anyway, still it was not enough. You can see the delta V in the bottom of the screen and our speed, which is higher than the delta V that we have available. So yeah, this is not going to work out for us very well. There's still litho breaking and there's plenty of lith below us. <laughs> uh, but no. No, that's not good. And yeah, the orange is not going to be able to save itself. As marvelous a uh, system as it may be, it has perished. So, I needed a bigger rocket. I decided to go with a Raptor 9 rocket instead of the new Glenn. But not just any Raptor 9 rocket. This is a rocket similar to a Falcon 9, but with 9 Raptors at the bottom. But I decided to go with a heavy as you can see, a heavy configuration where the two boosters would be recoverable, nominally speaking, though I'm not following them down. The core only has five engines because we are going to expend the core and we don't need more than five engines. Also, that will allow it to last for longer than the boosters. So off we go. And here I'm reserving the fuel in the boosters. They're all going to be nighttime launches because that's where we were as far as the moon was concerned. We have to obey the dictates of orbital mechanics and so our five raptors on the core do their job and that's all done and on to the second stage which is a single raptor vacuum engine so all with methalox plumes these days that's a nice one i like that i i sort of like that plume better than the waterfall equivalent to be honest because it doesn't have the hard edges but all right here we are making orbit and transferring off to the moon. And this time, this stage will have enough to make orbit, which it does here. So the orange will not have to do all of the work, and it will have a luxurious amount of delta V in order to land, so I don't have to be panicked at the last bit. Okay, we're doing a finer adjustment to the... Well, I say finer adjustment. The problem was that we had a negative periapsis because of the timing of the capture around the moon. And that would not have been good. Alright, leaving the stage behind. We aim to land, and we are close to the pole, you can tell because the camera is sort of shifting. I mean, we're not directly over the pole, but we're close enough that our heading is constantly changing. Not the most convenient spot, but we do have a station in orbit, so we have to think about that. I think I was putting it under the orbit of Mir, uh, Mir around the moon, and that was in a polar orbit around the moon. Okay, well, that's a hillside. That's not necessarily good. So, yeah. Well, that's, that's gonna come back to bite us later, but um, that orient... There, there we go. That's, that's the actual orientation. That's where we actually are. Uh, yeah, you can shift the camera to make anything look equatorial, but it's not. Alright, off goes the orange for potential reuse as a landing vehicle, as long as it's landing something fairly light. And actually, that base module was specifically designed so that it would 
be within the limits of the orange, so that's always good. And the orange can go back to the station, get refueled, and land something else if necessary. Now, there's a catch here. We didn't have one of these docking ports, the small docking ports that we have on the orange on Mir. So I need to send Barafel out to grab a docking port. The, fortunately, the orange had two of these docking ports, so we could grab one, put it on the station, and then the orange can dock on the station. So there we go, Barafel our engineer placing it on the station. And with his job done, Parafel heads back inside through the airlock right there. And we can bring the orange into dock. So suddenly Mir has this little orange appendage on it. But, you know, it's about time we mess with Mir a little bit. There we go. Alright, so next up we need to send some supplies to the base. Uh, just as backup, this time it actually landed with its supplies, but it could always do with a little bit more. And it doesn't have uh, that long a duration. But I'm using the Dynetics Lander system to bring the supplies, it's not a crew cabin there. But I had to offset it on the stage in order to get it to fit inside the fairing of this Vulcan Rock, Vul Vulcan Heavy, I'm sure people are thrilled, Vulcan Heavy. But a Vulcan Heavy also has really low thrust weight ratio, especially since I'm going to be throttling down the core. So I decided to slap on four boosters. So I have the core throttle down immediately, so it doesn't have the thrust weight ratio it would normally have off of launch, but we're using the boosters to solve that. And in using the Dynetics Lander system, we're not expecting it to come back to orbit. It's just gonna land and stay there, so that's why we don't have the drop tanks and we don't need to worry about that. Okay, and booster set. But unfortunately, the boosters took out uh, one booster's engine, one of the heavy booster engines. And so it all ripped apart. Yep. So, well, we need to tweak things a little bit. I just increased the size of the decoupler and moved the boosters down a bit and felt that that would work, so we give it another try. These are Gen 63 XLs despite their look. They're from KW Rocketry, which is an ancient, ancient mod for Kerbal Space Program. Much revered, but uh, yep. Yeah. Off we go again. And this time on booster separation, I hold on to boosters a little bit longer so we get through max Q, well, the high dynamic pressure anyway. So we just want to delay a little bit, which they sometimes do, before actually decoupling. And finally, when are we going to decouple? There we go. And it's close, but it's safe this time. So we continue. And here is liquid booster separation coming up. Again, you can see by the plume that the core is thralled down. And off go the liquid boosters. And I thrall up like this using the thrust limiter, the core. Alright. And eventually, of course, fairing set. And what we have is the Dynetics Spaced Supply Vessel. And on to the Centaur stage, such as it is. Separation and ignition of two RL-10s. And off we go. With all the effort from the boosters up front, of course the Centaur stage does not have much trouble getting to orbit this time. Even though it often does for me with the Vulcan rocket. And uh, here we are transferring off to the moon. And also using the stage to start off our capture around the moon, though it doesn't do the whole business. Uh, the Dynetics stage will have to do the rest. On the general topic of the Dynetics lander, I do have to say they put a lot of structure on it that probably didn't need to be on it. <laughs> I guess that might have hurt them in the end. I sure noticed that when working with the model. Uh, of course, this is a model that I adapted from the Dynetics model. Dynetics actually released the model and I adapted it into Kerbal Space Program. And here we are phasing with the base. And I decided to expedite because we did have boil-offs, so 
uh, we're doing uh, inclination correction in order to get to the base, and that is our approach. I'm not actually using MechJet blinding guidance, I'm using Smart ASS to control it. And uh, ultimately, Smart ASS doesn't always do the greatest job, and here it's definitely not able to control it very effectively. But more importantly, I have the base on the opposite side of this hill, and I didn't account for that. And so I was approaching as if we were doing it, you know, as if there was no obstacle. And there is an obstacle. And worse, again, this seems imbalanced somehow, or at least not very easy to control. And that leads us, well, you can see what's happening. It's not pretty. Yep, this is not good. I think the thrusters at the bottom, the 8th thrusters, do not have gimbling, and so it's just pure RCS, which is a little bit difficult. But yeah, taking a look, uh, our base is on that side of the hill, so that's going to be tricky. Well, with that in mind, I decide to uh, go ahead with the Raptor Heavy, if you will, or the Unix Heavy, technically. I called the Raptor 9 rocket the Unix rocket, uh, after a Jurassic Park reference, and so now we've got the Unix Heavy. And we've got the same sort of ploy that we had before, which is having only five engines on the core, and we're reserving the fuel and the boosters as they separate, hoping that their programming as such brings them back safely. Again, sorry for all the nighttime launches, it was just that time of the year. And here we are with the end of the first stage, which we did expend, and on to the second stage, come on. I don't know what the delay was, but okay. And there's the second stage, and the fairings, and yet another dynamic slander with supplies. So, hopefully this time we will be able to do it right as long as I plan properly for the hill, right? But still, it's a little bit difficult to control since those little thrusters are not gimbling, I don't think. So we capture into orbit, and here we go. This time I'm trying to sort of go around the hill off to one side. And we have some spare Delta V to work with in this case. I think we might have used the Raptor vacuum stage in order to start the descent. Maybe, maybe not. Another thing I tried to do is come straight down or closer to straight down instead of coming in more horizontally that helps to avoid obstructions but we're not slowing down nearly soon enough so we're overshooting here and ultimately I have to sort of come around I have to burn the opposite direction in order to approach it and we barely make it into the render range of the base now I want to do that because we're using simple logistics so I don't have to physically connect it to the base or anything like that, which is good because of the slopes, especially. I don't have to run a KAS pipe from this into the base in order to transfer the supplies. But I think we have to be in render range at least. Um, that's a little bit fast. And honestly, the landing leg configuration on this lander isn't the best. So we flop onto one side, but that's still fine for simple logistics. That doesn't matter. As long as we do this plug into network thing, the base can get some of the supplies out of the lander, and so that's all right. Another feature of the base is that it's a regolith base. I made this little animation where uh, little piles of regolith get put onto it to protect it from radiation, normally speaking, especially if it's in the right orientation. So now it's totally radiation protected, right? And well, I mean, it's good. It's better than nothing. All right, so it's all set up. And here we are with a New Glenn rocket, and we are launching supplies to Mir, actually. Uh, so we are leaving the base aside for the moment, because we need to make sure that our crew on Mir has food, water, and oxygen. And this is a fairly sort of standard mission, nothing to belabor. Off go the fairings, and as usual, I like to use my shiny little HTV. Not mine, I didn't make the model or anything, but... I, I make great use of the model, that's for sure. 
And uh, I, instead of using the regular engine on the HTV, which is the Japanese vehicle used to resupply the ISS, I use a small module with an AJ-10-190, which is the engine that was on the orbital maneuvering system for the shuttle and also will be used on the service module for Orion. Here we are removing the old HTV from Mir. So that's the previous supply vessel and we will bring in the new supply vessel. The HTVs have the benefit of having fairly large volume and being shiny. Now I'm leaving out the unpressurized section of the HTV. That's why this HTV looks shorter than the real HTV. And that's because I've only got the pressurized section and the propulsion module and the avionics module. So here we are docking and of course we have a docking port compatible with Mir. Not the usual common, common berthing mechanism on the HTV. And that's Mir around the moon with the orange and the HTV. With that, we continue with working with our base and I want to send crew there. And I decided to use the Blue Origin slash National Team lander, but not with the ascent module. You see, I've left out the ascent module, so it's not so tall. And that's because we're expecting to refuel it on the surface. So we're only using the descent module, which is hydrogen and oxygen, and we hope to refuel on the surface. Now there's a catch. The ascent module had the solar panel. So I put a solar panel on one side because on the other side is the hatch. So it's going to be imbalanced anyway. But then I put that nose to counterbalance the mass of the solar panel. <laughs> so that's why that red nose is there. It's to counterbalance the solar panel on the opposite side, which is where basically where the solar panel would go with the ascent module, but I didn't have that. So, yeah. Okay, so expanding the New Glenn first stage in this case because we want to make sure we have enough Delta V to get to where we're going, especially since we have crew this time, uh, which includes Raider Nick, uh, who probably did not want to go. Raider Nick is the one quote-unquote tourist who gets deployed w without actually paying or without actually wanting to go. So... <laughs> This is, this is just as a running gag. Uh, if you've seen the earlier part of the series, Raider Nick has already died and been resurrected once. So, and me, Diane, be resurrected again. It's, uh, it's a curse. Anyway, so here we are with the lander separating from the New Glenn upper stage and doing its descent into the base, which of course we have to be very careful with. But it's got a lot of Delta V to work with, and we basically aim to come straight down, like I said, to avoid any issues. It's got a fairly wide base, and it's not as tall as the original design was, so we're hoping not to topple, of course. Here we go, coming in, fairly high velocity. Uh, Due to the way the thrusters and the dynamics lander are configured, it looks like it's using the engines when it's not sometimes when we approach, but it's not, and that those are off. And the BE-7 engines are a little bit too powerful for this situation, it turns out, so I have to shut them down and use an extra ignition. They only have 10 ignitions by my configuration. And there we go, we sit down. It has a reasonable amount of Delta V left, actually, but... Uh, not enough, probably. And here we are just checking on this and making sure that we can transfer the supplies via simple logistics. So, solar panel out and logistics network requesting resources. We could uh, just transfer the resources directly, but the easier thing is just to plug into network and then all the resources are shared, and so we don't have to think about that too much. And I send Danlo out to the base to occupy the regolith base. So Danlo is not a viewer on Twitch. This is just a generic curl, if you will. So this time we were just trying to test out the systems so that we can have a base for Kerbals to visit. The actual tourists. Now, I, I, I eventually discover a flaw with this, and that's that the ladder doesn't actually extend low... Well, the built-in ladder for the base doesn't extend low enough for Danlo to grab onto it. I retract the landing struts, but it's still not good enough, so Danlo has to use 
the jet pack in order to hop up and grab and board, but ultimately gets in. So, well, a bit blurry there, but there we have it. Uh, we have an occupation of a lunar base, and it's an interesting lunar base. Nobody quite has this kind of lunar base. So, I look forward to making other interesting bases in the future, but for now, that does it for this video. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.